Good morning. I'm Robert Justice, and welcome to this service of First Presbyterian Church in Salina, Kansas. We're glad for all of you joining in this service electronically, whether you're listening to the radio broadcast on KINA 910 AM, 107.5 FM, or watching our online video stream via Facebook or the YouTube. If you would like a copy of the bulletin to follow along with, you may find it at either the church's Facebook page or at our website, fpcsalina.org. And now, let us pray. This is the prayer for the day. O oh, blessed Trinity, in whom we know the maker of all things seen and unseen, the Savior of all, both near and far, by your Spirit enable us to worship your divine majesty, so that with all the company of heaven we may magnify your glorious name, saying, Holy, 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 glory to you, O Lord Most High. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Trusting in God's grace, hear this prayer of confession. God of grace, love, and communion, we confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. 
have mercy on us. Forgive our sin and raise us to new life that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name. God did not send the Son to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. everyone. I hope that this message finds you doing well and having a great start to your day. I'm so excited because I've already heard from a number of you that there are a lot of new activities that have started up again that you haven't been able to enjoy for a number of months and some different places now that are opening back up that you can go and have fun at and so I know it brings some sense of normalcy and a time for us to celebrate all of the wonderful things that we're so used to enjoying that we haven't gotten to enjoy for a number of months but I pray that even amongst all of the things opening up and activities starting back up again that you all stay safe and you all stay healthy. And I know that Pastor Keith and Pastor Charlie and the rest of our church praise the same for each of you. So today is kind of a special day in the church. It's a little bit different. It is called Trinity Sunday. So Trinity Sunday can be kind of confusing for a lot of people, to be honest with you. And to be truthful, it's kind of confusing for me and a little bit difficult to understand. So when you hear the word Trinity Sunday, it kind of means three different things, but it's all one thing in the same. So let me explain what I mean by that. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sound like three different things, right? Well, in a sense, they are. They're three different people is what it says. But amongst the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have one God within each of us. So that kind of sounds confusing, right? I know it sounds confusing coming out of my mouth. So one way that I thought might be helpful to explain it is by using the idea of a hard boiled egg, okay? So most of you have probably seen a hard boiled egg before, right? So I'm not really gonna crack this, but um, when you look at a hard boiled egg and it's whole like this, what do you see? You see the outer shell, right? So we see the outer shell. Then if we were to go and we were to pull back this outer shell, what would we see next? Right, we would see the white part of the egg. So inside there's also a white part called the egg white that we would see next that would be hard and firm and kind of squishy and icky if you were to touch it. Then if we were to peel that all back, what would we find third? Exactly, we would find the yolk. So that would be the yellow part of it. So within this egg, a hard boiled egg, we have three things. We have the outer shell, we have the inner white egg part, and then we have the yolk. So that's kind of like, it's one egg, right? But there's three things inside of it. And so that reminds me of the Trinity. 
So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's all in one. And so we have one God. And within all three, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have God within each of those. And so as we go through our day and as we go through life, it's important to remember that God is always within us as well. And so although Trinity might be kind of a confusing idea and it might be something that we don't always fully understand, we know that no matter where we go, no matter what we see and what we do, God is always within us. And that is such a powerful thing to think about. And I hope and I pray for each of you that you all remember that message forever and always because he is always there beside you. And especially in these moments of uncertainty and confusion and us not knowing maybe what the right answers are for different situations or different things, it's great to remember and to know that God is always within us. And he's always within the Father, he's always within the Son, and he's always within the Holy Spirit. And what a great message to remember. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray together. Dear God, on this beautiful Sunday, we thank you for always being within us, for being within each and every person that we come into contact with. And we pray that we can always remember what a gift you are to each of us and what a gift we are to you. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to learn about Trinity Sunday and pray that we can always show your will and your love to each and every one that we meet. And all God's children said, Amen. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy one, guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And please join me in prayer. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end and at my departing. Amen. Do you ever feel as though you're going around in circles? There might be an answer for that. There might be a good reason. More cities, you see, are choosing a new approach to traffic control. City planners are replacing traditional traffic signals with more efficient roundabouts. You might have seen one in Junction City and other places. Proponents tout them as if they're the answer to traffic congestion and to big city growth because instead of drivers stopping and starting according to the changing lights, roundabouts encourage traffic to keep moving in smooth patterns. Traffic engineers have discovered that roundabouts are safer too, cause less air and noise pollution, and they're more efficient than usual stop and go traffic experienced at traditional intersections. The emphasis on roundabouts seems to be on cooperation rather than competition then. If roundabouts had existed in the first century, then Paul might have used them as an example for ordering church life itself. Just as with church today, some people would enthusiastically take on that challenge of a new idea. Others, you might guess, would moan, but we've never done it that way before. Yet roundabouts can teach us a lesson about how to survive in community, too. In roundabouts, as in churches, people need to pay attention to one another in order to get along. The challenge is to instruct drivers in the new, improved way of working with one another. It takes a certain amount of education, patience, and goodwill on the part of all concerned. But once drivers are accustomed to the new traffic circle, improved efficiency and safety are the inevitable results. The ensuing traffic patterns could be instructive to anyone attempting to live and work together like a church. There's nothing roundabout, though, in the words that Paul uses to conclude his second letter to the Corinthians. Just as he was approaching the end of that painful letter to a fractured congregation, just as Paul realized he had only a tiny bit of parchment left, he slipped in one last string of imperatives. He appealed to order. He appealed to mutual agreement. He appealed to peace. As Paul bid the Corinthians farewell, he left them with a to-do list, as it were, of last-minute reminders as they embark on the challenge of forming community in Jesus' name. Paul's last sentences then offer insight into life that we also gather together for as a Christian community. He hits upon a central tenet of teaching how to live and to act as the church and as the body of Christ. Paul emphasizes what's important. Let's all pull together. Let's be mindful of one another. Let's consider how to wrestle with the conflicts that inevitably occur, arguments, misunderstandings, even jealousies, whenever two or three are gathered together. Paul links the presence of the God of love and peace to that community with their movement toward such goals. The link between the closing exhortations and closing Trinitarian benediction is the reason we read that passage today, Trinity Sunday, along with the Great Commission that ends the Gospel of Matthew. The very qualities that are to characterize the Christian community you see already characterize the relations that exist within the Trinity itself. Order, mutual agreement, peace. 
Paul knows something important that without God's Holy Spirit, our koinonia, our community, our communion, our fellowship itself is indeed impossible. Indeed, it strengthens and grows us as Christ's body to live together in our differences, not despite them. Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that much continues to be required of us. We're called to put things in order as if God's Holy Spirit served as a metaphysical chiropractor to realign our out of syncness. Imagine how much vitality we might identify within our own church family if we could imagine God's unfathomably vast and intimate life flowing among us, infusing and enabling our very lives. It might bring to order ways in which our lives have become disordered and fractious. Case in point, it's so much easier for each of us to cut off those with which we disagree by ignoring them, by deriding them, by simply moving on, isn't it? It's true in politics. It's true in the nation's enduring stain of racism. It's also true in family life and well, as well as in marriage. We go quickly to where we think our best advantages lie, and remaining in the field to rumble it out with someone, being vulnerable to, be a, to beyond either or binary cho choice learning that may challenge us or even hurt us, seems a quaint old-fashioned notion these days, doesn't it? Yet, Yet it is precisely the notion that Paul claims is part of the life of a people who are one body. It's in such a life that we find ourselves realigned as one body, sharing the peace of God. It takes continual practice, friends. It takes continual practice for each new truth that we learn opens us up more and more to learn more. God casts a much bigger net of love than any of us can spread out on our own. And surely we recognize that our country can't belong to just one group. Our church can't either, can it? The challenges that face us require all of our best thinking and all of our goodwill. How might we speak our truth, remembering that we're blessed by God to do so, blessed by God to love, even in the midst of so much tension. That putting things in order tension sometimes takes the form of hard words as we've seen in the streets of American cities over the past week or so. We're not immune from such hard, hard harsh words here in rural Kansas either. In Marshall County to our northeast, the following letter written by a pastor was circulated among members of the local ministerial alliance. The letter read thusly, my sisters and brothers in Christ, I send this to you hoping that you will listen and pray for and with me. I believe that if there's to be change, it must start in the church. That's why we are outside of the buildings today for the primary questions, not when we're getting back in our buildings, but what is the work that God is calling us to do here right now? I want you to know that I'm mad, that I'm frustrated, that I'm disgusted, that I'm outraged. I've cried, screamed, and thrown things, prayed and sang and read scriptures, and cried yet again. I'm tired, so tired. I'm so tired of fighting. I've been in a battle all my life, and it doesn't matter how long this fight continues. In the end, I'm still going to be black, wrote the minister. Yes, I am black. The fight is against the black folks. It's against injustice and in inequality in the lives of black folk. As a mother, as a grandmother, as a great-grandmother, as an aunt, cousin, and friend, I have black male folks that I love, and I want to keep them breathing until God calls them home. I'm praying that there is someone in our cluster of ministers who's brave and bold enough to admit that truth. It would help me to know that we're still together trying to build up the kingdom of God, just admitting the truth, because that really is what this fight's all about now. And because our culture won't recognize and say that, the battle continues. What I am feeling is racial battle fatigue. I'm exposed daily to the battle of the chronic racial discrimination of a black person being part of a predominantly white organization, town, and society. 
and each day some little hint is dropped to remind me of my place. I'm a child of God. I'm an American. I'm also a descendant of the transatlantic slave trade. I have no reason to go to Africa, for this is my home. My descendants built this country. I'm part of the American dream. I've never known a day when America was great. I can, however, give you times when black Americans were treated like trash, when water hoses and dogs were turned on them, when governors blocked school doors, the killing of a black jogger, wild bunch police officer who kill at traffic stops or put knees on a neck for nine minutes. You must realize and understand that racism and the pursuit of justice isn't just a black issue. We're all our brothers and sisters keepers. How long before we let justice flow like a stream and righteousness like a river that never goes dry? Maybe COVID-19 will bring a second wave and we can go back behind closed doors and pretend things will be different when we again emerge. I can't breathe. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe on me. Black lives matter. Black cultures matter. Black communities matter. The voice of one in a seeming wilderness in Marshall County, Kansas. Living in community then, putting things in order, is much like driving on busy, crowded highways. Paul presents some rules for those roads. At times, it'll be necessary to yield, to slow down, to use extreme caution. Just like careful drivers, we're urged to keep our eyes on the road, not allow ourselves to be distracted by multiple influences, and to pay attention to the people who are joining us on the same journey. Paul's instructions could be compared then to a useful driving manual on our road to life. Perhaps Paul's benediction could be reworded with our roundabout journey in mind then. It might sound something like this. Farewell, brothers and sisters. Remember, we're all traveling in the same direction, although at different speeds. At times, a fellow traveler may need to exit the conversation, the project, life itself, before you do. Trust each other enough to allow that freedom. Keep your eyes on the road and wish people well in their own travels. Don't be so focused on your destination that you forget to enjoy the scenery along the way. As we continue in our roundabout journeys, let's endeavor to agree on the general direction that we're all traveling. We can work through our differences, can't we? At times, we may bump into each other, but because we're all traveling together, we can handle those collisions more gracefully, more easily. Acknowledge and be aware of the differences that exist, but celebrate the larger agreements that we share. Roundabouts. It's the way we live our lives, isn't it? Roundabouts, the way we handle traffic. Roundabouts, the way we get along with others. It's a vision of God's people traveling separately, yet together in a Trinitarian model toward a shared destination with goodwill, with God's grace, with confession and repentance. We can journey on this road together, black and white, young and old, rich and poor, male and female, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having heard the word proclaimed, let us then affirm what it is that we do believe by reciting the affirmation of faith adapted from the Confession of 1967. Jesus Christ is God with humankind. He is the eternal Son of the Father who became human and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit, is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. Amen.
Our prayers continue to be with the Cram family as they grieve the passing of Scott. A celebration of life service was held yesterday on live stream, and there will be a future celebration of life held at the church uh, once restrictions are eased from COVID. We would like to send well wishes to the following couples who have celebrated anniversaries in the last week. On June 2nd, Liz and Chuck Carroll celebrated their 57th anniversary, and, on, and Katie and John Weckel celebrated their 69th anniversary. And on June 4th, Anne and Jack Ludwig celebrated their 65th anniversary. Happy anniversary to these folks and all who have celebrated recently, including my parents yesterday. As we prepare to center ourselves in prayer, I'll note that part of this morning's prayer was written by Reverend Lauren Kristen Cockrell of Santa Fe Presbyterian Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. Let us pray. Holy God, one in three and three in one, hear us as we pray for your blessing, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us. Let us pray for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us. That churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gifts in service of all, we pray to you, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us. That the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the air, soil, and waters cleansed of poison, we pray to you, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy on us. That those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands, we pray to you, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us that you will strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated, and the old cared for, the hungry filled and the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. We pray to you, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us, that you will preserve all who live and work in this city in peace and safety, we pray to you, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us, that you will comfort and empower those who face any difficulty or trial, the sick, the disabled, the poor, the oppressed, those who grieve and those in prison. We pray to you, saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us that you will accept our thanksgiving for all faithful servants of Christ now at rest, who with us await a new heaven and a new earth, your everlasting kingdom. We pray to you saying, Holy Triune God, have mercy upon us. God, whose spirit hovers over your creation, you created all people and love all people. As creatures created in your image, help us to love all people. It sounds like a simple request, but our world is deceived by the ugly lie of racism. Our cities are burning with fires of pent-up frustration and senseless violence. Help our society to open our ears to the cries of our brothers and sisters, to open our eyes to the reality of our prejudices, to open our hearts to the suffering of citizens whose rights are not equal, to open our minds to find solutions that will enable true peace and reconciliation to the glory of your name. We pray for all people who mourn the losses of loved ones who died at the hands of systemic hatred. We pray with relentless hope for a miracle that this will never happen again. All this we ask of you, Lord God, through Jesus Christ our Savior and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we pray together, using the words that Christ Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have an announcement this morning that comes from our session. It reads, the FPC session has scheduled a congregational meeting on June the 21st, 2020, for the purpose of approving a request to the Presbytery of Northern Kansas to, to dissolve the pastoral relationship between the Reverend Dr. Charles Carroll Smith and First Presbyterian Church of Salina. The electronic congregational meeting, which will be conducted via Zoom, will begin at 11.15 a.m. following the worship service that day. A link for the Zoom congregational meeting will be sent to all FPC members. Instructions for how to take part and vote in a Zoom meeting can be provided to members upon request. Reverend Smith's last Sunday in the FPC pulpit will be June the 28th. He's accepted a call as interim presbytery pastor for Indian Nations Presbytery based in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, beginning August 1st. I'll note that our congregation has far exceeded our goal for Project Salina. The exact numbers are still being tabulated as mail and donations come in. You can expect an announcement of the amount raised in the near future, but we want to give a special thanks to everyone who donated to Project Salina to help combat hunger in our city. And we invite you to support the ministry of First Presbyterian Church, and there are four ways that you can do this. You can mail your donation to P.O. Box 585 Salina, Kansas 67402. Again, that's P.O. Box 585, Salina, Kansas, 67402. You can also give on our website, fpcsalina.org, on the Give tab. Again, that's fpcsalina.org on the Give tab. You can text your offering as well. Simply text the word GIVE or a dollar amount to 785-329-9830. Again, you can text the word GIVE or a dollar amount to 785-329-9830. And finally, you can download the Church by Ministry One app and search for us there. Again, the app is called Church by Ministry One, where Ministry One is one word. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods, yet refuses to help a sibling in need? Remembering God's great love for the world, let us offer our lives to the Lord.
God, our Father, with these gifts, we offer you our lives to do your work in the world. Take our bodies and our minds, our work and our leisure, our relationships with other people, our friendships and our family life, our dreams and our doubts, our faith and our plans for the future. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we bring them to you. Amen. And before our last song this morning, I'd like to thank Glenn Stovall, Marianne Weiner, and Britton Zuccarelli for sharing their musical gifts with us this morning, of course, along with Angie and Richard Koshgarian. Our last song is We Shall Overcome. charge comes from author L. R. Nost. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break, and all things can be mended, not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go. Live intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. May the all blessing then of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, be with you now and always. Alleluia and Amen.